we are coming to the last part of the book of James. Throughout his letter, his concern, I've said this many times, many times his concern is that we may mistake, mistakenly assume that we are genuinely saved, uh, that we are saved because we subscribe to the right kind of beliefs, because we think that we have faith, and because we engage in church and other religious activities. Now, James does not teach that we are saved by what we do, but he strongly insists that if our faith does not produce visible, practical, positive action, then it is dead. Not just weak faith, but dead faith, meaning it's fake, it doesn't exist. Right? And he, he, he writes all this out of love because uh, his concern is, I mean, the greatest tragedy in our life, we, we think that we are saved, but the kind of faith we have, no, it's not the kind of faith that is going to help us on the day that we're going to stand before the judge of the universe. Okay, so that's why he gives us all kinds of the different ways in which genuine faith will visit, you know, will, be, will, will be demonstrated. It should influence the way that we respond to trials and temptations, the way we use our tongues, and the way we use our wealth, the way we relate to other people, and the way we plan for the future. And here in today's passage, we come to the, what I consider the best proof of authentic faith, right? The, the most powerful form of authentication for our faith. This Monday, I took a flight back from uh, Chiang Mai, I visited our missionary uh, and his family there, uh, Pastor Aaron, and uh, when the plane touched down on Singapore, Changi Airport, the, when it, the wheels touched the tarmac, I immediately took out an ART kit. Okay, and I swapped myself in my seat on the plane. Uh, thankfully, it was only, the plane is like 20% full only, so I didn't gross anybody out uh, uh, sitting beside me while I was digging my nose. And by the time I exited the terminal, about 20 minutes later, I already sent in my result to the required we uh, government website. Uh, there's um, ART, uh, COVID negative. You know why I did that? So that I could go straight from the airport to a uh, leader's meeting. Otherwise, I would have to go home first. And uh, it's wonderful that uh, I could get it done so quickly. And we know that's the benefit, uh, usefulness of doing the ART test. It's fast, it's cheap, right? But we also know that it is not the most reliable because of COVID, now the whole world knows what PCR is. Huh? That the gold standard for virus, testing for virus is actually the polymerase chain reaction. And uh, it's slower, it's much more costly, but it provides a much surer indication. And do you know that similarly, you know, there are different indicators of spiritual condition and some are more telling, more accurate than others. And James now concludes with the most dependable uh, indicator of all. What is it? Well, let's look at today's passage, James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20, to find out. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produces crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of the way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. What is James' final emphasis? Or what does he offer as final proof of an authentic faith? You can't miss it here in this passage. It is prayer, right? It is prayer. Now, I think for many of us, this is kind of like counterintuitive. Well, this will not be the answer that we have thought of, right? Because uh, we can't see how a genuine faith will produce uh, self-control, holiness, humility, uh, you know, and, and uh, things like that. But 
prayer? What is the connection between genuine faith and you know, being a proof, a demonstration of, uh, of prayer, being a demonstration of our faith? Well, let me put it to you uh, this way. Suppose uh, there is a single mother who has a young son. And for many years, she works her uh, fingers to the bone. She screams, she saves, she makes untold sacrifices to raise him and to give him the best education that money can buy. That young man grew up, you know, well, he, he, he became independent, he was hardworking, he, he did his job well, he's a responsible person, morally upright, uh, even has a good heart, you know, give to charity, contribute to worthy causes. But he does not relate to his mother. Right? He, he only calls up once in a long while. Uh, and uh, yeah, especially when he still needs some kind of help from her. Now, will you say that this is a good person? Will you say that he's a good son? No, of course not. And in fact, if you're bright tonight, please make sure you don't relate to your parents that way, right? Because his conduct not only smacks of ungratefulness, it also tells us that he really doesn't want a relationship with his mother. He only wants to use his mother, but he does not love her. Now, I think you can see where I'm going with this because uh, that is why prayer is so definitive of our relationship with God and so telling of our true spiritual condition, right? The most obvious proof that we love God and that we want to have a relationship with Him, that we in fact do have a relationship with Him, is shown in how much we seek Him out and communicate with Him. In other words, it is the quantitative and qualitative nature of our prayer life. Now, having said that, I've been a Christian for 42 years, and I, I'll be first to admit that cultivating a consistent prayer life is no easy task. In fact, it is one of the most difficult things to do, right? But it's also highly rewarding. The Christian who grows strong in prayer will grow strong in every area, in faith, in humility, in power, in stability, in confidence, and in joy. Conversely, the Christian who is weak in prayer will never really make progress spiritually. In fact, James would tell him he better do a self-check. Huh? If you are really, there's no, no evidence of a prayer life, then you better ask yourself whether you have genuine faith, saving faith, or is it just dead faith? Now, the reality is I know many of you do struggle with prayer, right? But... Uh, I'm not here to guilt trip you or to beat you up, but I'm here to encourage you. Today, I want to share with you how we can cultivate a deeper prayer life. Okay? So to do that, James tells us that there are three specific things that we need to grow in. Number one, we need to grow in openness. Huh? We need to grow in openness. Now, I think many of us think of prayer as something private, something that we do between God and ourselves. Okay, it's an individual thing, right? Prayer is a very private thing. And it is true that Jesus does talk about praying in secret and God's secret reward for the people who pray in secret. But he said in the context of uh, renouncing the hypocrisy of people who want to use their religiosity to impress other people, right? Especially those who uh, pray with very lofty and very lengthy prayers. And Jesus is all against that. But the Bible does tell us that we ought to pray with other people, okay? We don't just hide away ourselves in prayer. There are times when we, you know, a lot of the times we need to go and pray with other people, okay? In today's passage, we see the same strong emphasis on communal prayer, right? It's not just that uh, it, uh, James says, ask the elders of the church to come and pray for those who are sick. He also says in verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another, uh, and uh, pray for each other so that you may be healed. Okay, well, I know this passage you know, raises a lot of questions, generates a lot of debates. Okay, and as I say, this is a sermon, so I'm not going to all, go into all that. Okay, if you haven't done so, go and read the devotions where I address, you know, I try my best to address some of these issues. But here, big picture, James is challenging us to open ourselves up in prayer. 
First, we need to open ourselves up to pray with other people. When I look back on almost, actually more than four decades of Christian life, I realized that one thing, one of those things that gave me a really good start as a new believer was that God graciously caused me to be inverse, uh, immersed in an environment uh, of praying with fellow believers. And I'm so thankful that that's how I got started because uh, now when I look back, I see how crucial that was. How did it happen? Well, when I went to secondary one, I uh, picked gymnastics as a cell, uh, CCA, and my captain, the captain of my team was in pre two, so he's five years older than me, and he was really on fire for the Lord. So he, real, uh, he made a lot of effort to reach out to us, and a number of us came to know the Lord. And, uh, we became Christians, and he wanted to follow up with us. He wanted to help us, okay, with, uh, with our newfound faith. So Saturday mornings, we have training, and after that, in the afternoon, uh, we will go and look for a classroom. Huh? He bring us to look for a classroom in the school, and then he'll teach us from uh, the Word of God, the Bible, not very uh, I mean, simple stuff, but it was great. But what really impacted my life was that he would get us to pray. And I mean really pray. Okay, as new believers, most of us, we had very little idea about prayer, but he would make us take turns to talk to God out loud. He didn't teach us any techniques or rules, uh, ACTS on that, right? But just encouraged us to express what was in our hearts and just pour it out to God. Okay, there was, it's so strange you know, when you think about it. I mean, there, there was no such thing as prayer items. Now, today we find it hard to pray without a list of bullet points of things huh, to help people pray. But in those days, he didn't even give us any prayer items. He says, just, just speak to God. Okay, and uh, we didn't go around in a circle sequentially. You know? It's not a rigid thing, it was a spontaneous thing. Anyone could pray at any time, so long as there's only one person who prayed at one time, and we just listen to each other, and that's how I learned to pray, really, by praying with other people. And it was uh, just so amazing, because my leader would set a target of one hour, <laughs> one hour, okay? He would tell, challenge us, pray continuously together for one hour. And then for the last 15 minutes, he, say, he would say, okay, let's get down on knees, or hold hands you know, in a circle, and then we would you know, pray the last 15 minutes. How could a bunch of new and young Christians pray together for a whole hour? The amazing thing was that actually it was never a problem because when we gathered to pray, we soon discovered the reality of the presence of God. Okay, the presence of God just fell, just came into our gathering. It was a truly enjoyable experience, and I look forward to it every week. Well, sad to say, most Christians never get to experience that thrill, uh, that kind of satisfaction, that, that kind of joy of uh, praying together with other believers because uh, they don't understand the necessity or the power of praying together. And yet, this is so important. I think the one, one of the most powerful illustrations of this is when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Uh, we're going to um, look into, very much into this. Huh? Come, uh, Good Friday is coming. But uh, we know that when he went to the Garden, Jesus took along three of his closest disciples, uh, three, hu three of his best human friends, lah, in other words. But we also know what happened. Luke, um, Mark chapter 14, verse 37, say, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Okay, well, many of us, we, we, we understand this feeling, right? We're supposed to pray and we end up sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, Jesus, we know, was about to go to the cross very soon to bear the sins of the world. His, his spirit was in torment. Right? And so he retreated the garden to pray, to pray the prayer of his life. But he did not want to go alone. He brought his three closest disciples with him. And it was not just to model for them. You know, when you read this, you realize, okay, and think about that. These this, this clueless guys, huh, we know, they, they would, there's no way they could have grasped the 
depth of the enormity of his agony. And yet Jesus wanted them to come. He made himself vulnerable to them. He said, my soul, uh, my soul is uh, so overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here. Pray along with me. Pray alongside me. He longed for them to pray alongside him in his greatest hour of need. Consider that. If the Son of God needed people to pray with him when he was struggling, how much more? We all need that. So let us be open, okay, to each other in our prayers. Let us be open in two ways. First, let us be open simply to just pray with other people. And I understand that many of us have a great fear of uh, praying with other people. You know, when uh, I was... Uh, in church, one of the things I really hate to do, hate it when is when the preacher or worship leader say, hey, turn around and pray with the person next to you. I don't know the person, right? It's, I just find it so awkward and many of us struggle with that. Now, I understand that, okay? I understand that fear. Uh, but remember, there is far greater power in communal prayer than in individual prayer. So, let's overcome the fear. And the only way to overcome the fear is by actually doing it. And it's not just the human side. Think about it from God's side, uh, God, the anger of, of God's perspective. If one of my children comes to me and boldly makes some big expensive request, say, Papa, well, can you give me this? Okay, expensive request. Okay, very easy for me to say, no, uh, I think cannot. Uh. No? But what if he's a little bit wiser and he brings another, one of his siblings come along, two person now. Hey, Please, can you give this to us? Now it gets a bit harder to say no, right? But what if all four of them, united front, come together and say, Papa, we really want this, we really need, we've discussed this and we think that this is really good for us. Well, very hard to say no, you know. Huh? Very hard to say no. Not because I don't have the authority to say no, but my heart is moved, right? At their passion, at their unity, that they want it together and come together to do it. And chances are, I'll say yes. And of course, if my wife joins in the petition as well, then... Okay, that one, no need to say that. Better say yes, right? <laughs> so, I mean, think about it that way. From God's perspective, okay? When we unite in prayer, when we gang together huh, and come before God, it, it's not that we manipulate Him, we twist His arm, no? But it pleases our Heavenly Father's heart. And He moves Him to grant our request. It pleases Him to grant our request when He looks at our unity, so, let's be open to join with other people, other fellow believers in prayer. The second need is to be open with one another about our needs and our struggles and our failures and our sins. James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the staggering implication of that is that there are prayers, there are requests that God is Actually, he, he, he's prepared to answer one, but he's not going to answer, he's not going to grant those requests unless we are authentic with one another. And that's, what, that's what it implies here, right? God will only answer when we confess our sins to one another. Why does God work like that? I mean, it is, it's not our confession to one another that brings about our forgiveness, right? It is what Jesus has done. Why does God require this? Well, I don't know the answer. But I know what this tells me. It tells me that God values community far more than us and that He honours our prayer, especially when we are humble, sincere, and transparent with one another. So let's seek to grow in openness with each other, uh, about our spiritual con con condition with each other. So guys, there's, there's a simple way to put all this into application, what I've said so far. Okay, let's join in our monthly prayer and praise. Okay, next month's prayer and praise will be special, will be a milestone because after more than two years, we are going to go back to do it in person together. Okay, we are going to meet at the Bridling Training Centre and we are going to come together uh, as children before our Heavenly Father and say, God, Father, we, we are in agreement with this. We really seek this from you. And I believe it will please the Father's heart. Several hundred of us come together to do that and say, God, we want this. No? Can you grant it to us? Okay? So let's, uh, we're going to shake that place in prayer. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Okay, tell everyone stick next to you. See you at PMP. Okay, not on Zoom, huh? but in person. 
Okay, number two. Number two, the second way we need to grow deeper in prayer is to grow in righteousness. Uh, is to grow in righteousness. Now, one of the things I really miss about uh, uh, during the last two years because of the pandemic was uh, my extended family gathering. My, my extended family, that usually like 40 of us will gather for special occasions. Okay, and it is, well, we really miss that. But one thing uh, I always remember about those occasions is that when it's time, when the time comes to eat the food, one of my siblings will invariably say, oh, someone needs to say grace. Let's ask the pastor to say grace because pastor pray more powerful. Okay, don't tell my family members, uh, my relatives, lah, but I always thought that's so stupid, you know. You know, I always think that's so, such a stupid thing to say. Okay, don't tell them that, lah, huh? But uh, in my mind, I always think, how powerful do you want saying grace to be? What difference do you think the pastor's prayer, even if it's true, what difference do you make? You mean pastor pray the food more delicious? Ah? Pastor pray the food got less cholesterol and less calories? Ah? I mean, what, is this? what is this? But actually, I, I always decline one. I always refuse to do it. Very awkward, but I refuse to do it because I don't want to reinforce the stereotype that people in certain positions, with certain titles, are more powerful in prayer. Now, it is true, James does say, get the elders of the church, come and pray for the sake, right? But the point really is not that their prayers will be more effective because they're elders, because they hold a certain position, they got a title. Okay, actually, the Bible says uh, stringent requirements for Christian leadership, like elders, huh? and one of the things is they must be righteous people. So chances are, get the elders can pray, they are righteous people. Hopefully, but... Uh, the point is not that they have a title or position, but the point is righteousness. God responds to righteousness. God answers the prayers of righteous people. And that's good news because it means you don't need a title, you don't need a position. Every one of us can grow in righteousness and become more effective and powerful in prayer, right? James says in verse 16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And then he cites the example of Elijah, right? He's a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly. They will not rain. They did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed. Heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Now, he cited the example of Elijah. Uh, Elijah was a hero, especially to the Jews, you know, a hero of Old Testament, the chief of the prophets. But James didn't want them to get the wrong idea. He qualifies it immediately. Okay, or in fact, even before. Okay, he said anything else about Elijah? He says Elijah was what? A human being even as we are. In other words, Elijah, he's saying Elijah was powerful in prayer, not because he belonged to some exalted category of God's servants. Rather, he was powerful in prayer because he was a righteous person. So the point is this, and the point James wants to make is, any ordinary person like you and I who is righteous can boldly ask God for big things and God will grant their requests. Psalm 34, 15 to 16 say this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. I find this is such an encouraging and beautiful picture if you think about it. Okay, because it, it shows a God who is wow, listening, eager to respond. Okay, maybe to me, the con modern uh, equivalent is like, you know what? Like Google Home. Huh? Google Home like that. Listening all the time, just waiting for you to give and you know, say something, to respond. And for the righteous person, the psalmist tells us God is like that. You know, uh, he, he's waiting for the righteous He's ready to respond. He's ready to move his mighty hands. The righteous only need to open their mouths and God will respond favorably. That should provide us with tremendous motivation to live a righteous life. Let me confess a sin. Last week, my wife wanted to bring my son out for Dean, uh, lunch, a special treat, school holiday. So she wanted to bring a nice lunch at a, well, expensive restaurant. So I couldn't go that day. But when I found out the restaurant they were going to, I said, hey, I have a membership card. 
Okay, you can, uh, I can get 50% off at that restaurant. So why don't you just take the card and go? Okay, the next day, morning, I started my prayer time and I just said, hey, something is wrong. Yeah, I'm not getting through. And the Spirit of God just impressed on my heart and said to me, you know, the terms and conditions of that membership card say it's not transferable. So you shouldn't have given it to your wife. That's dishonest. You're trying to cheat. And you know, my heart is, my human heart is so fallen, right? My heart is so fallen. My instinctive and immediate response was, God, you know, uh, I've used this card so many times. Nobody ever asked, no, does this belong to you? Uh? And I'm sure many other people do this. They cheat. Uh, they just give it to your family members to use. Why can't I do it? I don't think the restaurant even cares. It's, and I just tried to carry on with my, my usual prayer routine. But at the end of it, I know that, you know, it, it, it's not working. But I'm so stubborn, right? I just refuse to do anything about it. Next morning, usual time of prayer again, I started praying and, oh, this thing came back even stronger. You know, I, I just couldn't get through. And uh, in the end, I just, I just go, okay, I'll talk to my family tonight, man, dinner time. So I spoke to them, okay, and consulted them and said, look, this car is not transferable. Should I give it to mama to use? My children are far more righteous than me. La. They said, of course not, la. how can you cheat? Right? <laughs> but they are also a lot wiser than me, I realized, because I tend to see things in black and white. They say, I just asked mama to tell the waiter, this car belongs to my husband, can I use it here or not? They say, cannot, cannot, I can, okay, la. You know? I say, wow. You know? That's a uh, you know, different, uh, from different perspective. But, uh, well, my wife went to the restaurant and asked, and they said, cannot. Uh. And I'm so thankful, right, that the, my deception didn't go through. Uh, I'm so thankful my deception didn't go through because it's not worth it. Okay, not just because it's wrong, because it wouldn't be, it would be so foolish. No matter the amount of money they're going to save, and it's so stupid. It's like maybe $50, $60 difference and my wife can well afford it. Okay, but no matter the amount, it is not worth jeopardizing the effectiveness of my prayers. And you see, and when you begin to pray, when you take prayer seriously, you find that it has a very powerful effect. It makes you want to become a more righteous person. Okay, so that your prayers will be effective and powerful. Now, righteousness. In the Bible, righteousness is not the only factor that affects our prayers, but it is definitely a big one, a major one. So guys, think about this. The things that you are praying about, for all you know, this is the issue that may make a difference between whether your prayers, your requests are granted or not granted. What if your righteousness is the, you know, it, it make, it's the thing that's going to make a difference in your prayers for a loved one's salvation? What is the, what, what, if that's the thing that's needed? What is the, that's the thing that's stopping it? What if it makes a difference? Uh, what if it's the key to God answering your prayers for a miraculous healing, maybe for yourself or someone you know? What if it's the deciding factor in resolving a serious issue in your home, your business, your family, your workplace? What if it's the thing that will cause God to open the doors, deliver you from the situation, orchestrate a certain thing? That may well make the difference. Tell the person next to you, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You see, we ought to live righteous lives anyway. Right? Because God is a holy God. But fighting against sin, to be honest, is tough. And the connection between righteousness and effectiveness in prayer gives us added inspiration to walk in holiness. So deepen in prayer, we need to grow in righteousness. Number three, to deepen in prayer, we need to grow in earnestness. Huh? In earnestness. Now, from personal experience, and in fact, over the years, ministering to many people, I realized that the greatest obstacle to prayer is not actually a lack of righteousness. You know what's the greatest ob obstacle to, to, to answer prayer? It's prayerlessness. Okay? The greatest obstacle to answer prayer is that people don't even pray, or they pray very little. You get no answered prayers, 
because you don't pray. Now, most of us, to be fair, have tried prayer at some point. I'm sure even some of you who don't even consider yourself Christians or not quite sure you, you are or not, but you also pray, you tried it out, then you didn't get the desired outcome and you got discouraged and you give up, okay? And then you, you just languish in your prayer life, okay? Did it, or you, you just do it in a very perfunctory way. Now, it's important to understand that righteousness is not the only factor. Verse 17, James says, like just a man, a human being, even as we are, he prayed earnestly. Tell the person next to you, earnestly. Actually, in Greek, it does not say the word earnestly, okay? Or the older version says fervently. Okay, in the, in the original, it does not say that. Do you know what it actually says? It, it, it literally says, Elijah, uh, with prayer, Elijah prayed. Right? With prayer, he prayed. With prayer, he prayed. That's what he says. And that sounds really awkward to us, right? But it's a literary technique. Right? It's repetition for emphasis. It means Elijah prayed and prayed. He kept on praying. He refused to stop praying. He prayed doggedly, persistently. And if you go to the backstory, you'll understand why he says that. You go to 1 Kings chapter 18, it tells us Elisha went to the top of Mount Carmel and then, <laughs> it's an interesting expression, he said he put his head between his knees and then he told his servant, go and check the sky, got cloud or no cloud. So the servant went to check, come back, don't have leh, no cloud. So Elisha put his head between his knees again and then he told the servant, go and check one more time. The servant went, check, eh, come back, still no cloud leh. And Elisha told the servant, do it again. Okay, what did he say? He repeated that many times. No cloud. And by this time, the servant must be very fed up already. What is futile exercise? Huh? Do this for what? But the seventh time, Elisha, Elijah put his head between his knees. He told the servant, go and take a look again. He went and there was a cloud, a small cloud. And then the cloud grew and rain came back to the land after a long time of drought. And my question is this, guys. What if Elijah had stopped after the sixth time? God wanted to answer that prayer, but it required him to pray earnestly. Listen, there are prayers that God intends to answer, requests that he is happy to grant, but only if you keep on praying. Tell the person next to you, keep on praying. Okay, only when we pray earnestly, when we pray fervently, when we refuse to give up, Press on in prayer. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the people of God, all the Lord's people. Tell the person next to you again, keep on praying. Okay, I think if there's one lesson you can take away from this is, guys, get started with your prayer life and establish it. Do everything you can to get this part of your spiritual life in place. Grow in earnestness in your prayer. How do you do that? It's not easy. Now, the best way to make that a reality in your life is to set aside a sacred, protected, uh, special, regular time to pray every day and to guard that time jealously. Don't allow it to be disrupted, interrupted, and to Keep at it, press on until it becomes a habit in your life and it becomes entrenched as a lifestyle and in your bio rhythm. And I understood this in a fresh new way because of the pandemic. You know, prior to the pandemic, um, you know, I actually, the, 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 the thing that, uh, I, I did not find all these restrictions in the pandemic, uh, all these you know, restrictions too bothersome. Because, well, as an introvert, I actually enjoy the st stillness and the solitude of being cut off from people, you not know, being able to travel or that. It wasn't difficult for me at all. What I found truly damaging was the disruption to my devotional routine, my prayer life especially. See, prior to the pandemic, okay, my life was very orderly. Every morning, I send my son to school, 7 a.m. Okay, drop him off and I go straight to the office. And then I have like a good one and a half hours to pray, to read the Word of God before the rest of my colleagues start coming in. So that routine was very easy to keep up because my son's school disciplines me. Understand? Okay, I, get up, I will get up for him, right? So no problem. 
Wow, when the pandemic hit, it brought chaos into my life, into my spiritual life. Okay, go. Uh, uh, home-based learning, and sometimes go to school, sometimes don't go to school, and then in my own life, you know, uh, work from home, sometimes, some days got to go office, some days don't go office. There was no routine. Everything was so disrupted, and I found that I was floundering in my prayer life. Okay, especially when the government start opening up, uh, sometimes can do, some can uh, like, Wow, it was so difficult. Without that routine, I find that, hey, cannot make it, man. So six months ago, the Lord laid it on my heart that you need to start a new routine in your life. Okay, one that wouldn't be disrupted by any of these kind of changes. So I thought hard about it. And in the end, I said, there's only one way to do it. Lah. I set myself the goal to wake up at 5.30 a.m. every day, go and take a walk, and pray at East Coast Park. Eh? I, I could walk there. I can walk there from, since I can walk there from my house. So I set myself that goal. And I can tell you initially, it was just incredibly difficult. The, the hardest work I do every day is the, when I wake up, or you know, trying to get out, get out at 5.30 in the morning to go and pray. But I think God was really gracious with me. And after you know, uh, a while, I find that, hey, it's not such a struggle anymore. Maybe for the first 10 seconds only uh, when I wake up. But actually, I find that uh, I didn't even need a alarm clock anymore. It's, it, you know, your body is just an amazing thing, the way God constructed it. Because usually, I, about, I wake up and look at my, my, my clock, it's 5.28, 5.29. You know, I just can just... Turn off the alarm clock. I wake up even before the alarm clock. Now, there's a body clock at work now because I keep doing it. Okay? And uh, I find that uh, I, I could begin to do it consistently every day, seven days a week, even on Sundays before I have to come here and preach at two services. And interestingly, one of the things that really gave me tremendous encouragement to keep doing it was my Galaxy watch. Okay? No product placement here. But you know, because the watch will say to me, Congratulations, four week streak! Wow, so happy, you know? <laughs> Kept going. More importantly, I began to enjoy the return on investment. I began to experience the benefits. Now I look forward every day to that special time because I, I want to go and meet my Heavenly Father because I know He is eager to receive me. Right? He's there for me and he's eager to receive me every morning. And I, after a while, I begin to realize the pattern. I realize that if I miss out on that prayer time, just one day, two days, it, you know, it affects me. It, it, it becomes harder to control my thought life. Right? Uh, it becomes harder to love people, to forgive people, and it becomes harder to resist temptation. And then when things happen, you know, when I experience setbacks, when I face problems, criticisms, people writing nasty emails, I lose perspective and you know, the joy in my life, I find that the next morning, when I go back from a daily appointment with God, it always brings me back on track. Those of you who use Google Maps, right? you, 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 you know sometimes you use Google Maps and then you zoom and then you scroll. After a while, you lose, lose, lose track of where you are. Get to know where you are. Then what do you do? You hit recenter, right? There's an option there, recenter. And the moment you touch it, you find your bearings again because you're put back in a place where you know where you are, where you are and where you need to go. And I find that that daily time is powerfully centering, recentering. No, it, it, it brings me back to where, who I really am, a precious, beloved child of God. That everything else, good and bad, actually they are secondary. Okay? There are many things I have to deal with in a day, many things that happen to me, but they are secondary. And I, I want to say my mental health improved tremendously as a result of that as well. Okay? Because it is, this daily time prayer is so powerfully centering. But perhaps the best part of it all is that because now I devote so much more time to prayer, I don't want to waste the effort, you know? So it gives me a lot of motivation to pursue holiness. I mean, far from perfect, but when 
I can tell you this, when you are setting aside regular time to pray, when you're praying earnestly, you will find that you have a lot more incentive to live righteously, to grow in righteousness because you don't want to torpedo all the hard work that you have put in. Earnest prayer does not just change things. It changes you above all. You know, one of the most common feedback I get hearing from church members, Christians, is this, that I know God feels very far away. Okay, recently I just talked to two young men. Okay, they grew up through uh, Sunday school, new fellowship, and then they said, you know, uh, we know all the theory, and uh, you know, we're brought up in a Christian way, but we're not sure God is real because we hardly experience Him. Okay, it's just like a concept. Is He real? Okay, and many of us struggle with this. And people come and tell us, uh, we want to leave the church because we are not growing, God doesn't feel real anymore. And that. Do you know what's the solution to all that? I can tell you this. If you develop a regular prayer life, if you become earnest in prayer, this problem will go away. This problem will go away. God will not seem far away. When you have a regular prayer life, God is only a prayer away. And not only that, prayer incentivizes you to pursue righteousness and because you begin to live more righteously, you begin to get more answered prayers because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now God is more pleased to answer your prayers and so you see more evidence of His work in your life. So not only does God feel near, you begin to see more and more of His handprints all over your life. You see, when you pray earnestly, God becomes real in every way. Well, do you have to wake up at 5.30 a.m. every morning? Spend one whole hour in prayer. No, of course you don't have to. But don't go back and do nothing either. Business as usual. You need to get started wherever you are. Okay, move on wherever you are to set aside a protected time and then work at it, press on until it becomes a daily habit. Okay, don't be contented with saying, I pray on the MRT on the way to work. I mean, God listens to you, lah, but how much relationship is that? You're not going to be able to pray earnestly if you do that. Don't say, I listen to Christian music, that's my prayer time. I mean, it's great listening to Christian music. But God wants you to talk to Him. Okay, so work at it. Make that a reality in your life. Don't rest until that is a reality in your life. Until you begin to sense and see the benefits for yourself. Then you will enjoy it. Nobody will need to force you to do it. Nobody will need to track you. You will look forward to it. You will want to do it. Is it easy to pray earnestly? No, oh, it is not easy at all, but it is worth it. Tell the person next to you, it's worth it. Because when you keep at it, you will be changed by prayer. And through your prayers, you will change the world around you as well. Amen? Okay, so guys, this is the final lesson. Final thing in your Christian life that ought to be happening if your faith is genuine. So tell the person next to you, keep on praying.